Thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon, everyone. And sorry not to have been here earlier in the day. I describe myself as a split-shift worker these days. Uh, when you're working on international panels, you go to about three in the morning, then someone wants you on a, a morning TV program at seven, and then you, you head back to bed. You know? so <laughs> eventually, you stagger your way down to the quarters uh, by the, uh, the mid-afternoon. But I have had the uh, opportunity to see uh, Peter uh, Gluckman's opening uh, keynote speech and also uh, Jacinda Ardern's uh, keynote speech. Uh, Peter, of course, began by reminding us that Auckland Unlimited wanted us to think in the future of Auckland in strategic terms. Where do we want to be, and how do we want to uh, get there? And I think that that's really important because, you know, Auckland sometimes gives the appearance of, of muddling on with all these incredible pressures that it has, the very fast population growth, the sprawl that's going on around it. Uh, I ventured up uh, north at Anzac weekend and find, you know, the urban traffic gridlock goes to Walkworth and beyond these days. I'm a regular commuter down to care for my father at Waihi Beach, so I see the sprawl down to Pocono, and I'm told if you go to Te Kofota, that's where uh, young couples uh, are buying now too. So, you know, we're, we're under pressure. Uh, and to outsiders, I think, and I spent a lot of time outside Auckland, when they think of Auckland, they often think of housing crisis, poverty, gridlock traffic. And I think, you know, we obviously in our strategies have to have strategies for turning the perceptions around because it is a wonderful city and one that I've been happy to call home for 58 years since I came up here on a road services bus as a little girl to go to boarding school in 1963. Uh, so, uh, look, it, it's great to see that, that Auckland is linked into the big global strategies. And I spent you know, eight years based in New York uh, working on first developing and then promoting these strategies, um, supporting rollout of the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and so on. And uh, you know, Auckland strategies recognise these, these landmark international goals and, and strategies. Auckland is an innovator C40 city, you know, the, the cities that really want to make progress on climate change. But we, we have to walk the talk, don't we? If, if we say we're going to be big on climate action, then our, our plans have to reflect that. And sometimes there's a, a gap between um, uh, aspiration and, and reality. So I think if, if I was looking for str strategically for what I'd want for the best of our city, uh, obviously quality of life. You look to livability, you look to clean air, uh, you look to parks and reserves, you look to a city that's uh, biker and walker friendly. I'm thrilled to see the low traffic neighbourhoods being a pilot and, and only hunger. I think that's uh, you know, really something many of our neighbourhoods would aspire to. Easily accessible and understood public transport, that's a, a no-brainer. I certainly look to inclusion and to the kinds of partnerships we need in Auckland to, to end uh, homelessness, for example. And a big shout out to the City Mission. What a phenomenal job has been done with the support of so many uh, to build the, the new facility uh, in the middle of the city to house the homeless and help uh, them you know, get their lives back together, deal with whatever issues they have and, and be able to, to stand tall. I think that's incredible. Need big partnerships, obviously, for affordable housing. And it, it is time for a world-class city like ours to do even more building up and not uh, out. Uh, we are rolling out into those uh, greenfields areas where we still have brownfields areas we could do uh, a lot with. It goes without saying, one wants to live in a city with an aspiration to be equitable, inclusive, and embracing its uh, diversity, and we are so diverse. We want to be a city with great community facilities, our big halls, our little community houses, our libraries, that's vital. And then, certainly very important to me, but I think to everyone in one way or another, is arts and culture and festivals and celebrating who we are and creative expression. Uh, our galleries, our museums, our heritage places, our, our theatres, you know, these are just so Im important to us. Um, I'm one, and another is coming along this afternoon, John Key, who's had the thoughts about the waterfront. But I really hope you know, the opportunity can be taken to redevelop that incredible precinct uh, right down on the harbour as a place for people with a mix of residential, uh, entertainment, facilities, open space. Uh, partnership with Ngāti Whātua in planning it will be extremely important. 
And then one looks to a city that's going to be economically vibrant and, and vital. We want to be innovation city. We need supportive ecosystems uh, for that. And I'm sure in the discussion earlier today, again, you've been talking about the, the opportunity to keep the, the innovative go-ahead Kiwis who've relocated located here during COVID, keep them for uh, the long term. But they need an ecosystem in which they can thrive. And uh, if their business is successful and growing, they need the skills base. And we have to invest in both the ecosystem and the skills base uh, to make it possible to be that, uh, that kind of of, of, of city. Uh, I think COVID has had a lot of people reflecting on, on life, uh, how they want to live it, where they want to be, and why not Auckland? If we can make it the best city uh, it can be. We can have quality of life here, but we've got some challenges to uh, overcome. And I'm sure with you know, bringing the best brains of the city together at an event like this, you, know, you come up with so many ideas which are positive and relevant uh, to making uh, Auckland the, the world-class city we want it to be. So those would be my, my opening thoughts, and now I subject myself to an interrogation by Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> that one. Thank you. I'll, I won't interrogate, I promise. <laughs> um, the last time I saw you in person uh, was actually when we were filming Team New Zealand lifting up the America's Cup and you were down there helping to celebrate. What kind of level of an investment do you think we need to put into those kinds of events? Large. <laughs> well, look, OK, declaration of interest. I am the patron of Emirates Team New Zealand. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was uh, Prime Minister when the, uh, the first defence was run. Uh, all, all the hard work had been done on it, by the way, by the time I became PM in late 99. But the, uh, the Challenger series and then, then the defence were out in the harbour in, in early 2000. And it was just an amazing feeling to see Blakey and the team repeat what they'd done uh, you know, several years before in the US to bring the, the cup here. So I've kind of lived the America's Cup story a long time. Uh, 2003 was disastrous, <laughs> and we did invest you know, money to get it uh, through to 2003, but when that boat broke up in the harbour, your heart broke with it, right? That was uh, not good. Uh, and we had a very big call to make as to whether to stick with it or not. And we said, look, you know, Kiwis are the best yachties in the world. They're crewing everybody else's yachts as well. <laughs> so we must have something going for us. So let's stick with it. We put a lot of money in to go to uh, Valencia, you know, several tens of, of millions. And I went up to Valencia. I was supposed to be the, quote, 18th man, because they didn't provide for women, on the boat in the first race, but it didn't happen. But uh, I went on the harbour with no winds. But anyway, that didn't work either. And then San Francisco, uh, we was done, <laughs> as the saying goes. Uh, and then Bermuda, it came right again. So what a journey. And it was such, just a thrill for me to see it back in the harbour and to see, alas, we didn't have the international visitors. That was impossible. But it made it possible for the Kiwis to get a real slice of the action. And I thought that the atmosphere around Auckland was fantastic. And you, you really, you know, you had a, a sort of, you know, choke in your mouth when you saw the Kiwis just converge out on that harbour, on the water, and then when the boat came in. Now, this is not unimportant, right? We've been through one awful tough year, and to have, have something that made us feel good about our, ourselves, uh, you know, successful winners, uh, you know, we've, we've done relatively well, pretty well by global standards on the COVID front too, but America's Cup was phenomenal. So, uh, I'm one who says, let's, let's do what we can to keep it here. I think, it's, I think it's really important. And I think, as you were saying with the arts and culture and what Helen Clisser was saying earlier too, it, it is a form of engagement and bringing people together. I do want to jump topics a bit because we don't have a whole heap of time and I wanted to ask you about the WHO report that you've... Uh, been spending many sleepless <laughs> nights um, working on, but I see that there's also a question on Slido about it, so I'll take the question from the floor. It says, uh, last year here you said that New Zealand should independently review its COVID response. You've just finished that global review I mentioned. Has New Zealand done a good job of a review? So my, my recollection is that, that there has been an announcement a number of months ago about uh, a group that's going to review the response, right? And it could be a rolling review. Uh, 
but every country should, should do a review, for sure, just as the World Health Assembly asked uh, the Director General of WHO to set up the Global Review, which I've been co-chairing and which we just uh, uh, launched on, on Wednesday night our time. And uh, you know, big shout out to the, the Herald for you know giving it a you know good good space and 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 my op ed and, and so on. But you know, it's had good coverage here and globally fantastic coverage because people are looking for they want to know what happened and, and they want to know what lessons can we learn from that and they want to know what's the way forward and, and that's what we need to do at the, the local level as well. Now just as here we were challenged with uh, getting this review document out in time for the World Health Ministers meeting later in the month uh, while the pandemic's still accelerating globally. Horrific uh, situation. Uh, so we made immediate recommendations, but we also made recommendations that, that need to begin to be acted on now because we don't know when the next dangerous novel pathogen <laughs> with highly transmissible potential is going to arrive, right? In, in a way, with pandemics, we've escaped a bullet for 102 years before COVID uh, came along. Don't count on it being that long uh, next time because zoonet zoonotic diseases, the animal to human transfer, they're, they're coming at us faster than ever as we invade more animal uh, habitats and as we you know, are more careless with our in environment and, and so on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, th things have to change. Uh, our recommendations say we have to lift this above the level of uh, health ministers to uh, the attention of heads of state and government globally. We want a global council at that level. We, we want a new uh, financing mechanism based on from each according to their means to each according to their needs uh, uh, formula because uh, poor countries will need help to be properly prepared and to be able to respond. And, and here's the nub, you know, this is a global public good. We can't get on top of this anywhere unless we get on top of it everywhere. We'll be maintaining a closed border forever if we can't see vaccination roll out to every corner of the world comprehensively. And not just once, right? Because a number of the vaccines that are out there now aren't going to cope as they are right now with the new variant. So people are going to have to be revaccinated. So if we think it's tough to get one lot of vaccination out, think about doing it every six to 12 months for everyone. I mean, it's, it's a huge exercise. So anyway, we've offered a lot lot of uh, thoughts on that and on uh, what needs to happen to strengthen and empower the WHO. Often we think of these organisations with grand titles, we think they must be very powerful. Actually they've got no power at all except to try to persuade people to do things and that's got to change as well. Uh, so you know, lots of meat in it for those who are interested and easily accessible online. And I, I am going to jump now uh, to climate change because COVID, I guess, has distracted us a wee bit from climate change, but how do businesses and communities prepare for that, or is it going to be like the pandemic and suddenly hit us in the face as, as a major problem? Well, it, I wrote a forward to this new book of essays that uh, Alan and Unwin uh, published last month, uh, Climate Aotearoa in which I compared the way we've reacted to COVID to the way we've reacted to climate change. And there's no comparison. Why is that? It's because climate change is a, like a, a slower onset train wreck, right? We know it's coming. Scientists are telling us it's coming. And, you know, the climate is changing. But we haven't here had a, a sudden enough, major enough, event affecting everybody of, of the nature of, of, of COVID. And maybe we won't. It'll just keep uh, coming up on us. And I used an analogy somewhere the other day. I said, it's like being a lobster. You put it into cold water and you turn up the, <laughs> the gas ring and it doesn't realise, but it's slowly being cooked. Well, climate change is a bit like that. It's not like COVID. Now, with COVID, because it was dramatic and everybody felt threatened, and we were, uh, we got people to do extraordinary things. Uh, including, you know, huge limitations on their personal freedoms to beat it. We're not at that point yet with climate change where people are prepared to say, OK, I'll make the changes that need to be made because it's not hitting us in the face the way COVID did. Uh, we are running out of time, but I'm just going to take one more question from Slido. Does the government have a coherent vision for Auckland? And if not, should it have? And I wonder if this ties in too with something uh, Sir Peter Gluckman was saying earlier around communities, neighbourhoods creating precincts, uh, is there a coherent vision? Well, you can't run Auckland from Wellington, can you? So uh, that's the reason why you know, 
when was it, about 2007, whatever, uh, our government decided to set up the Royal Commission because while it was a huge advance uh, to go in the 1989 local body elections when Michael Bassett was minister from over 30 Auckland local authorities, remember the, the borough of Newmarket and uh, we had some pretty tiny boroughs. <laughs> we went from over 30 to seven in, in what is now the Auckland Council region. And everybody, you know, people hated that. You know, they said, we're gonna lose our communities. Of course, we never lost our communities. <laughs> They're still there. And then, but we, we, we bought the argument and you know, the Auckland Chamber and many others were behind this uh, uh, that said that if we're going to have a world-class city, it, it's got to be government, government as, a, as a single unit. And uh, it fell to the next government to you know, take that report and, and the, the, the super city was, was, was put together. So I think, I think that was positive. But I think to the greatest extent possible, then the super city has to get on to determine its own destiny. Some say, oh, Wellington will never let that happen because it's frightened of a powerful Auckland. I, I actually don't think people think like that. It, it's just that the, the habits of central government and meddling in, in local government are, have gone on for, for decades. And, it, and it's hard to break, but I think really empowering Auckland with with the means that it, it needs to, you know, chart its own courses in as a national city, comparing itself with the the Sydney's, the San Francisco's, the, you know, the the Cape Towns, uh, you know, others with the uh, Vancouver's, others with a big vision. Uh, that that Auckland's got to be liberated to do that. Right, Honourable Helen Clark, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of those questions, but. Please put your hands together to welcome. Thank you very much.